the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Kingdom Driven Family Podcast with your host, Andrea Schwartz. This podcast will equip and empower you to help advance Christ's kingdom through God's primary institution, the family, building a home that serves Christ and His kingdom. Hi, this is Andrea Schwartz again with another edition of Homeschooling Help. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Andrea. It's good to see you. I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. I did. I did. It seems like 100 years ago, though. So it gets to, I guess that means maybe our lives are too busy or not busy enough. I don't know. No. Anyway, today, before we get into today's um, discussion, which is the 10th part of a 10-part series, I just want to reiterate to those who either watch this live or subsequently on video that this is an overview. There is plenty more to learn. In fact, I have conducted biblical law classes for the past 20 years. And when I systematically go through with a group, sometimes it takes three and a half to four years to complete. So one half hour session on each commandment doesn't exactly do justice to God's law word. And it's not meant to. And I would encourage anybody who is listening, and specifically since this homeschooling help is geared towards homeschooling moms, um, go to the Chalcedon Teacher Training Institute. The web address is ctti.org. And you will see laid out a systematic way to go through this. Not everybody can devote the same hour every week on the same day to a four-year study. So I put together an individual study plan so that you could go through it. And as you go through it, it will be as comprehensive as what happens in group classes, but you just don't have the benefit of listening to other people's ideas, which is a big benefit. But in order to make it something so that if you have questions as you go along, uh, Nancy and I are available if you want to discuss and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, or how would I apply that? The, the whole idea of being helps in homeschool is that it's not just what we say, that we both intend to be um, a, a resource for you, not hand-holding so that we're going to run your homeschool, your family, because I don't know about you, Nancy, I don't want to run anybody's family. I have a hard enough time running my family. Um, so, so the idea is that you would become proficient at communicating these ideas. Right, right. Thank you for that, Andrea. That is really true. All, all we want to do um, is to be faithful to point folks to the law word of God. And to in these in these short little half hour sections, we see how we have made God and his word so small and limiting. So if all we do is just begin to crack the door on that and say, you know, the Christian um, Christianity is a faith for all of life. It's a comprehensive worldview. It's not just little, you know, a piece of this and a piece of that. But right. God really right. has spoken in all these areas, and we need to be mindful of that. Right now, a comment just came up. What's the website again? Ctti.org. Or if that's hard to remember right now, Calcedon Teacher Training Institute.com. And even though I geared this in my studies to women over the years, a lot of the women who approach this as individual students, they do it with their husbands, they do it with their kids as part of their home school. And so this could be a whole family endeavor. Just because you're doing it not in a group of other women doesn't mean that it can't have almost immediate applicability to your family. Right. And the word of God is designed to show, to show us the character of God, show us the path of righteousness. And as believers, it's a lifelong endeavor. We're not going to get it in half an hour. We're not going to get it in three years, you know. So we need to, um, to look to our original source documents in this, which is the word of God. And I appreciate the work of Chalcedon that is faithful to remind us that that is where we need to need to look. Okay. So, now let me just um, say one thing before we jump into our topic today. 
Um, Cal Seton has been extremely generous to those who are eager to learn because all the materials, uh, lectures, books, articles are all available at no charge if you just go to the website. And even the Calcedon Teacher Training Institute is made possible because Calcedon thinks Christian education for adults as well as children is important. So if you benefit from these sections or you benefit from the Calcedon Teacher Training Institute or just the website in general, uh, this is a good time to thank Calcedon for being faithful and um, the resources that you put towards Calcedon allow Calcedon to enable more people who want to learn have access to this material. Right, right, very good. Okay, 10th Honor. Commandment, how does it read? Well, the 10th Commandment we usually think of right away is do not covet, right? My little grandson says, do not covet, and he goes like this, and you know who he is, um, who he's modeling is the guy on Lord of the Rings. Gollum, who is coveting and 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 looking to try and and get that ring, and that he calls as precious, so he's obsessed about this thing. So so that's what we think of coveting, you know, when when we say it. But but we know that coveting is is has got to be put in its context. There's coveting that is good, covet a good thing, and there's coveting that would be um, evil. So the scripture in the 10th commandment puts it into context for us. It says in um, chapter 20 of Exodus verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservant, nor his, his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbors and so so there's coveting this good there's coveting it's bad there's certain things that we shouldn't covet but what does covet mean exactly that's not really a word that we use very often and um um why there's another thing let's make a note that it's a, it's spoken to of um a neighbor's wife. That doesn't mean that it's just for men not coveting wives, but for wives not coveting somebody else's husband or children not to covet. It's not just to the man. Okay. So this is where grammar is important. You know, for people who are homeschooling and saying, what, what, what do I need to do grammar? You, yes, you need to do grammar because you have to understand God's word in terms of parts of speech, who's being addressed, um, are there qualifiers, things like that. So the whole idea of coveting or covet is a verb. That means it's something that one does. So you mentioned coveting could be good, coveting could be bad. I would say you don't know what coveting it is unless you have a subject and a direct object. So let's take the, the verb eating, okay? If I say, do not eat poison, that's a lot different than saying, do not eat. Oh, right? yes. Right? right? If I say, do not love money, that's a lot different than saying, do not love. Right? So right. as God specifically gave this commandment to Moses to then pass on to the children of Israel and to be passed on to us, it's important to look at it that this is a summary, you might say. At the beginning, the first commandment said, no other gods before me. This says, in essence, be grateful for what I give you, be satisfied for what I give you, and don't look at your neighbor and say, he's got better stuff than me. Now, why is it mentioned as the man and the wife, you know, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Why does it say, and women, don't covet your neighbor's husband? Because God's primary institution is the family. The father is the head of the family. Feminism notwithstanding, the father is the head of the husband and the father, both together, same person, is the head of the family. And try running a company if everybody is the chief executive officer. Right. Try running anything. If, if there's no coach on a team, 
who makes the decisions as to what to be done. So let's get away from this modern think that says, you know, women, we must assert ourselves. You want to assert yourself as a woman, be a godly woman who follows God's law and helps and, and encourages your family to thrive as a godly family. So the 10th commandment is saying, be satisfied with the talents and gifts I've given you and the fruit of your own labors. That's what right. it's basically saying. So it's directed to, you might say men, because it's saying don't cover your neighbor's wife and you can only have a wife if you're a man, right? But it's basically saying, do not live your life in such a way as focusing on what's good for me as opposed to what serves God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do I want? Yeah, we don't need to live our life in terms of what I want. That goes back to um, idolatry, not serving God. So you, we see how all these commandments connect. And when the scripture tells us that if we break it at one point, we've broken it all because they are so interconnected in terms of um, our relationship with God and to each other. How do we represent him? Where's life? Okay. Sure, it's the same way that when we study the human body. OK, we'll uh -huh. study the circulatory system, the nervous system, the muscular system, the skeletal system. I've just never met a muscular system on its own. <laughs> it, 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 without the bones, it wouldn't be there. Without the circulation, it wouldn't continue to stand. So we may look at things in isolation in order to understand them better, but it's a unified whole. You can't sep separate a man from his heart, from his mind, from his soul. You can't because he's an entire person. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the things that I, I was um, reading in uh, Dr. Rush Juni's um, Deuteronomy commentary was talking about how coveting leads us to not only to um, not trusting God and not being thankful for what we have, but we um, we try and take shortcuts and get things illegitimately. Um, without regard to proper work and character and thrift and obedience to God. Right. So, so lots of ways we, we may do that. Yeah, we have the work commandment, work six days and rest the seventh. So God's mm -hmm. already establishing that we have godly work to do and work's not a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. I entitled this one, does our society encourage us to covet? Absolutely. Our whole society is based on coveting. When you mm -hmm. turn on a commercial or you you watch print media advertising, it's all meant to instill in you this desire for things. Now, you might say, well, they're not asking you not to pay for it. Really? You know, when we have a socialistic welfare system and, and I get mine and everybody has to get what the, my rights and what I'm entitled to. Yeah, we're basically saying, let's make people say, well, the government should give me health care or the government should give me education or the government should give me housing. You see, mm -hmm. as soon as we want stuff that we don't want to work for and not accept the fact that maybe we're just not as talented as the next guy or we're not as hardworking as the next guy. So what stuff he has is his stuff and what stuff I have is my stuff. Now, if I want to get better, then maybe this guy will help me learn how to get better. But my solution isn't to take from him so I can have more. Right. Yeah. So the, um, the idea of working connects to this and we cannot um, steal. It's, it's another way of stealing or, or it leads us to do that. So coveting what, what things should, uh, would be good for us to covet? Well, I think that's off the point, to be honest with you, because we're talking about the things God says not to covet. Okay. okay. So, um, so we should always to, to sort of answer your question, seek to, you know, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto us. So if we're looking at coveting is unrighteous desire that will lead to unrighteous speech or unrighteous actions, then we've got to check it. You see, you can sin in thought, you can sin in word, and you can sin in deed, 
right? Mm. So this coveting is the unlawful way to get what you want and forcing other people oftentimes to provide it. Mm. So let's take something that most people would never think of in terms of this com commandment, abortion. So somebody wants to be sexually promiscuous and wants a fail safe so that he and she don't have to be responsible for the child that comes about. And so long before we had Roe v. Wade, we had people basically saying, I shouldn't have to do something I don't want to do. And then they found legal means, quote unquote, to make it so that they could go and kill their child. And then they went so far as to say, not only should other people pay for it, but it should be free for everybody whenever they want it. You see, that's covetousness in action, where things mm -hmm. become legal on a societal level that are unlawful in a biblical realm or a biblical perspective. Right. So they were their coveting was the freedom. They were they were coveting the freedom to in, um, to another man's uh, wife. Uh, they were they were coveting another man's wife, but they didn't want the responsibility or um, consequences of it. Right. See, coveting basically says I should determine for myself right and wrong if I want it is good. Isn't that the sin of Genesis three five? Sure. Adam and Eve were coveting at the instigation of the serpent, but they still committed the sin. They were they were told, don't live by God's rules. Now, God's rules were certainly not oppressive. There was one rule. It's the only thing they couldn't do. They could do everything else, but that was one rule that they didn't want to follow because they wanted to be as God. And so in a very real sense, all violations, either on a personal, familial, church, uh, business, or societal in the civil order realm, is all about wanting to play God. And our society is rampant with it. And we've, matter of fact, you know, pat ourselves on the back that you have candidates and, and elected officials who rally everybody into saying, if you want it, that's sufficient. So you yes. want to, you know, you want my stuff, you can take my stuff. Well, why have any rules at all if all it takes is wanting something and then you could go through whatever means to get it? Demanding it. Right. Okay. What else? Tell us some more. <laughs> okay. So where does a lot of this perspective um, to get a sound view of it? It happens in the family. So do you okay. have children who witness you coveting the things that you don't have? You know, living in debt, running up credit card debt, um, basically saying, I'm going to transfer this responsibility. I, I want this now. And, you know, years from now, I'll have to pay it off or maybe I'll declare bankruptcy or whatever it is. It's not being satisfied with the fruit of your labors. And so if you have children that, well, he does this and how come we can't do what the next people do and whatever it is, it's important to get them to see that they're, you know, shaking their fist at God. I don't like the way you made me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So are we, if you come at your neighbor's wife or his his belongings or his business or the tools of his trade, you see, that's going to inspire you then if you don't check this sin to go and find ways in which to get his stuff. Right. And we neglect doing the things that we can do and developing right. our own skills along the way, waiting for God and trusting his provision. The whole idea of marketing. The whole idea of commercials is all about to get you to want something that you may not need. Sure. I mean, I'm Are not going to, I don't use iPhones. So this isn't just because I don't use iPhones, but if you have a phone that works and they come out with another one, why do people line up to get the latest iPhone? Somehow or other, they have been inspired to think that this is going to make their life better or happier. You know, the whole Black Friday nonsense is all about 
inspiring coveting so that people are going to go and get those deals. Really? How, how many things do they buy that they don't need? And how much was it? Um, um, the price increased before it was reduced on sale for these great sales. Right. So consumerism, as we have it today, is almost at the level of religious fervor. You have mm -hmm. to have the latest. I mean, my inbox is filled with come here, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday, Black Friday, you know, save 20 percent, save 50 percent or whatever it is. Um, if that's where we're focusing our attention, we are um, in basically becoming better at coveting the things we don't have. Sure, sure. One of the things that we said um, when you first came on the air was ab about Thanksgiving. At this time of this recording, it is Thanksgiving and coveting. Uh, giving thanks is absolutely opposite of um, Thanksgiving. The way it's currently practiced, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the whole idea, I think, I didn't even know how the term Black Friday came about. My husband said it was that, so retailers will say that if people buy, they go in the black and they're, they're not running at a deficit. Well, if they're going in the black, are people going in the red in order to spend money there? So just the idea of not being satisfied. I mean, I live in California. And there are people in Northern California as a result of those fires who have absolutely nothing left in terms of possessions. I wonder if they really look back nostalgically on the trinkets and the other things that they just had to have, or they had to give their kids because, you know, this is what they wanted for Christmas last year or make your list. Even the whole idea of, you know, Santa Claus and making a list so that Santa Claus knows what you want. Who cares what you want? <laughs> what does God want? And let's be and, satisfied with one thing. Yeah. And, and the Lord has already told us he knows what we need and he gives us what we need. And so for us to want um, or, or to think that we need something that he hasn't given us is not true. The psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He says, if we belong to the Lord, there is nothing that we are lacking in that right and because too many people really don't get what the christian faith is the christian faith isn't what we do to effort and like i'm showing a lot of faith and i have a lot of faith you know the faith is what overcomes the world and it's god's law transmitted to us that's the faith the law mm -hmm. the prophets the gospels these are things that say this pleases God. And if you do what I say, this is God speaking, you'll be blessed. So in actual fact, Thanksgiving is just the beginning of recognizing the great benefit we've been given. Um, by the time we're looking at, yeah, 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 okay, you know, turkey, pilgrims, cranberry sauce, or whatever it is, our lives should be a life of Thanksgiving. Every day. Mm -hmm. And that comes by being satisfied, being content with what you have. You know, sometimes I've had more than others. But you know when I find that my family relationships are more genuine and real? When I don't have the surplus that allows me to be frivolous, where I'm thinking, okay, if I'm going to give a present, what would be meaningful or beneficial to this person as opposed to, I've got to get this person something. I don't know. Uh, you know, and people are running around on Christmas Eve trying to figure out something that they give. And it's usually something that's not of much benefit because it wasn't really thought out. And, you know, the whole regifting things is because people get things that they don't need or want. Mm -hmm. And so they either give it to somebody else or they donate it someplace. Right. So consumerism is, is sort of pro coveting. Mm hmm. Yeah, we see in very small ways how we um, can either um, teach our children to be thankful for what they've got or encouraging a covetousness. I'm thinking about um, Thanksgiving and turkey and cranberry sauce and how in so many days we just say, well, what do you want to eat? What do you want to eat? And we really can't have anything that we want to eat. And I know moms who will give one kid one breakfast and another kid another breakfast and daddy something else instead of 
you know, instead of bring into the table a, a healthy, nutritious meal and everybody eat together and enjoy that um, common table and that fellowship and and thank God for his provision. So even just coming to the table and thanking God for our food is a, a, is an effort that counteracts that um, tendency towards covetousness that we all have. I think everybody you know, in Western civilization that has had the benefits of not extreme poverty or want thinks it really matters whether you like the food you eat or not. Now it's a plus, but if it's sure. food, um, mm -hmm. it's food. Or do I like every piece of clothing that I ever put on? Well, if I'm cold, I want something warm. If I, you know, I want something that's modest or whatever it is, but this idea that we have to love everything really feeds this, this, this beast inside of us that says, you know, if I want it, that's sufficient to do whatever. So not all desires are covetous. So I don't want to make it sound like if you have a desire or an aspiration or a goal, it's bad. It's just when we let it consume us that it becomes mm -hmm. a gateway to other sins. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's consuming us, if it's self focused and out of selfish ambition, rather than towards the things that God has called us to and faithfulness to his word and his covenant um, and our obligation before him, coveting those things, we have great freedom to covet and work and desire those things um, right. and to pursue them wholeheartedly um, as it is pleasing to God and ask for his favor in those things. It's when we cross that boundary of coveting those things that he's told us not to covet that we are, uh, that we are out, out of bounds, obviously. So it's really check our heart, not just our, our, our pocketbook and, and the bank account and my clothes closet, but, but our heart and our mind, we have to also consider. There are things that we're born with. We didn't, you know, the world was going on before I was born and it will go on long after I'm gone. Right. Yes. And there are things now that people are questioning that really have no business being questioned. You know, God made you male or God made you female. The fact that you're going to go through all sorts of other things to change that starts with coveting that which you're not. And you see, until you get a proper view that we are created, we're not evolved, we're not chance, we are created beings by an almighty creator, then we start off and we say, thy will be done. Okay, this is the way you've done it. Whether or not I like it, whether or not it's comfortable, whether or not I would rather have blonde hair, but I had brown hair, whether or not I would rather have been tall if I'm short, these are things that we can build into spending our life trying to change the things that we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, might, this might not go over well with some women, but when you decide that you're gonna dye your hair to look younger, are you coveting the fact that you have so many years under your belt? Are you, you know, are you saying I, I have to covet youth? So it really is all around us. And, you know, the expression now is check your privilege. Well, I think we'd all do better if we checked where we're coveting things unrighteously. That's the thing we should be asking ourselves. Right, 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 right. The scripture tells us that, that we are all stewards and that the, that um, the Lord gives us each of us in um, accordance with our ability and that we'll be held responsible um, and accountable for how we, how we did that. So, so whether it's our, our physical, uh, our, our physical bodies, uh, the resources in terms of money or our voice or um, any, any of those things, we, we will be held accountable and have to steward those things. So, so we can't say, I, I want that if God knows and he hasn't given it to us because either we don't need it or he knows that we are not going to be responsible. Um, we can't handle it. And then there's other scripture that comes to mind. It says, if you don't have something, um, it's because you didn't ask or you asked for the wrong reasons. So there's right. all kinds of, uh, kinds of ways that we really need to 
um, to check ourselves and look at what the scripture scripture tells us and um, to begin to function in terms of God's call on our life. And let me just say that this whole business about sexual identification and all this other stuff, I think really has its root in a violation of this commandment. Um, I had a child who didn't like the fact that she was a girl. Mm-hmm. She said she used to say things like, God said, God made a mistake. I should have been a boy. And I would say, no, God didn't make any mistake. But her problem wasn't that she really didn't want to be a girl. She had an older brother and he got to do things that she thought were fun. Sure. She could do those things. There was nothing that said she couldn't play baseball or she couldn't, you know, play soccer or something like that. It's oftentimes the people who hate God who create these stereotypes so that people then are going to be rebelling against stereotypes and misassign it to this is what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that a woman can't work with her hands, you know, that she can't be um, intelligently able to design something or whatever. It's not that women and men don't have the ability to have capacity because God puts it there. It's that we don't want to override those things that God says are how he has created human beings and how he intends the family to be. So we got to be careful that we don't fall into the stereotype of thinking that boys only, you know, boys aren't sensitive, boys are just crass and girls, you know, can't be bold or whatever it is. Let's let our picture of what we should be come from God's word. And then we'll be able to discern this is just something that's getting me to be dissatisfied with what God has created in me. And and just to let you know, that daughter who didn't like to be a girl, I think she's got more, you know, frilly things in her closet now than she ever had. and, And she didn't want them at the time. But that wasn't it. It wasn't that, well, you have to be a frilly little girl and you have to play with dolls. It isn't that. That doesn't make a female a female. God makes you a female. And you live out according to what he says, according to his word. So let's get away from arbitrary humanistic stereotypes and recognize that God is the one who is best equipped to tell us how we should live. Right. Very good. Very good. Okay. Alrighty. I think we're at the end of our time. Okay. Well, Andrea. It's been uh, always been a pleasure. This has been a really very, I really think this has been a very beneficial um, series of talks. Thank you for agreeing to do this with us. And um, we're going to do a little bit different things for the next couple of weeks. um, So folks can be uh, looking forward to that. But if they have any questions again about the Ten Commandments, the law of God, it is a lifetime of, of um, study, and, and we don't want to study it just so that we can recite the Ten Commandments, but so that we can apply these things in faithfulness um, to God. So thank you for, for all the insight you've given us into the commandments of God. No. It was freely given to me, and I feel um, honored oftentimes to be able to transmit it. So until next time. Very good. Thank you for joining Andrea Schwartz and the Kingdom Driven Family Podcast. Holding up the family and self-government as a true and lasting means of transforming society. Please visit thekingdomdrivenfamily.com and reconstructionistradio.com.